Hi, my name is Mark Coniglio and I'm the creator of Isadora. So today's tutorial is called Real-Time Modulation and Internal Cues. What in the world do I mean by that? Well, modulation means that we apply a set of numbers to modulate or kind of change the value of something. And in this case, we're going to be using some of Isadora's generator actors, which generate streams of numbers to manipulate parameters in Isadora. And then internal queuing. Now, the scene-based structure of Isadora, sometimes that's all you need as you move from one scene to the next if you're doing a sort of show that happens in order. But sometimes you need little internal cues, things that happen inside the scene that you want to cue at a particular moment that doesn't really fit into the scene-based structure. And we're going to learn how to use uh, those same uh, generator actors in combination with a couple of other actors to do those sorts of internal cues. So here we go. Let's jump in. As we always do at the beginning, we go to the output menu and say show stages so that we can see the preview of the video. And I'm going to start by bringing in this clip of this sort of out of focus street scene. And I'll make a little room here between the movie player and projector. Okay. So what's a generator? A generator is an actor that makes something on its own. All Isadora actors that have the word generator in them do that. And it's not just numbers. Sometimes it's video and there's other functions where Isadora actors sort of create information. Yeah. And in this case, to see those generators, we go to this little sine wave icon in the toolbox and we click it. And that's the generator section. And in terms of numeric generation, generating numbers, there's only five. And what you want to look at here to start with is the one called the wave generator. So I'm going to click, bring that into the scene, and deposit it. So you can see in the diagram, there's sort of a sine wave in the center and this yellow line moving across, and the numbers at the output are changing all the time. Well, if you were to somehow graph the numbers coming out of that actor, they would in fact look like a sine wave, like the shape that you see there. And we can change that shape to other shapes, and you'll see that in a minute. But first, let's just see it in action. So I'm going to take this wave generator and connect it. I'm going to click on the output and connect it to the intensity input of the projector. Okay, there it is, fading in, fading out. So it's going up and going down in relation to the stream of numbers that are coming out of the wave generator. So the thing to think about here that you'll hear me say again, and Isadora, a number is a number is a number. Today we're working with generators, but we could be using sensors, something that measures the movement of an arm or the tilt of an object. In the end, they all end up being numbers. And so a lot of what I'm doing will apply if you start working with some kind of sensory input. So just keep that in mind. These are numbers and you can use them anywhere. So in fact, let's try using this somewhere else. If I take this link, between the wave generator and the intensity, and I select it. And if I hit the delete key, okay, it's disconnected. Now wait, our movie's nearly black, or yeah, pretty much black. Why is that? Well, at the instant that we disconnected that link, the value here was really low. It's 0 0.09 or something like that, right? And Isadora doesn't know that you'd like it to go back to the default. It just does what you tell it. it. It takes the numbers and it responds to them. So it holds on to that number when you delete the link. So we could either set this back to 100 by dragging it manually. But sometimes in a case like this where it's totally black, you get a little confused like, where's my picture, right? A really good practice is to select the actor, especially the projector actor. This is helpful. Go to the actors menu and choose reset to default values. When you do that, everything in the actor is reset to the way it was when you first brought it in. And if you lose your picture, that's a great way to find it with the projector actor. But let's try a different input. Remember, I said a number is a number is a number, right? So let's try connecting this to the horizontal position. So now you see that it's moving the uh, image back and forth, again, following that sine wave shape, yeah? But let's, I'll disconnect that and set that back to zero, so horizontal position to zero. I could also connect it to the zoom. So there it is, zooming in and out, going up between zero and a thousand percent of normal size. So I guess the thing I'm trying to point out here, I'm going to set that zoom back to 100 again. 
These numbers can be connected to any input that accepts a number in Isadora. And that counts for every actor in the program. So these generators are very powerful in doing manipulations of Isadora in real time, yeah? Okay, let's take a closer look at the wave generator and then we'll move on to a more important actor that you need to learn for this. But just to finish this out, I'm gonna connect it again to the intensity. So it's going up and down at a rate, and that rate is set by the frequency input. It says one hertz or one cycle per second. That means it takes one second to go from low to high to low again. So if I change this to go to 0.5, now it's going at half the rate it was going before, so it's slower, right? So you can change this rate at any time. But you can also change the wave, the shape that it's doing, right? Right now it's a sine wave. But if I click on that input and I drag this up to the next one, which is sawtooth, now it's doing a sawtooth shape named after the saw that saws wood because the teeth look like this. They go up and they jump down. And they go up and they jump down. Yeah? Another version is the square wave. It's either on or off, as you see by the little diagram. Now I'm going to go back to the sine wave that's more pleasing for this. And um, the other inputs are the once input, which means do it one time and stop, and the reset input. Anytime you trigger that, which you can always trigger something by clicking with your mouse on the little minus sign, as soon as I do that, it immediately jumps back to the beginning. Okay, so that's some of the other inputs on the wave generator. Those, the wave generator is great for doing generative patches, patches that sort of make their own images and do things over time. We'll do that in another tutorial to look at how you can use that more. But now I want to delete that actor. And I want to go to the projector and do reset to default values one more time to make sure everything's like it was at the beginning. And now I want to move on to the more important actor, one that you'll use in Isadora a lot, and that's called the envelope generator. So I click here, bring it in, and put it down. You'll see this one has a diagram in the middle too, but it's gray because right now it's not active. While I'm here, I want to point out there's an envelope generator plus plus. It has some additional features and can do a bit more, but it's also a bit more complex. Don't work with that one today. You need to work with the, just the plain envelope generator. All right, so what does the envelope generator do? Well, it has nothing to do with the English word envelope, which has to do with sending things through the mail. Instead, that term comes mostly from music synthesis, where we use envelope generators to change things over time, yeah? And that's exactly what the envelope generator does. In its default state, it's gonna count from one number to another number over a certain period of time. So let's look at that. You see here, there's a value zero, that's the starting point. And then there's value one, that's the ending point. And the value that's between that, this rate one, that's how long it's gonna to take to go from the starting point to the ending point. So let's trigger that just to see it happen. So I'm gonna go here to the trigger input and I'm gonna click. And if you watch carefully, you'll see very quickly, it takes one second to go up that ramp. And if I do it again and you watch the output here, you'll see those numbers change, right? So. It's sort of like the wave generator, except that it stops at the end of its ramp there. So if I connect that to the intensity input and I trigger this, beautiful, we have this fade in. And now maybe you can see where I'm headed because this idea of internal cues I mentioned at the beginning, maybe you would like to have a video fade in at a certain point in the scene instead of transitioning for the scene because you've got another movie that's playing already. So the envelope generator is the way that you can do that, right? Now, if we were working in a real show, I wouldn't certainly, during the middle of a show, want to have to try and find that input and click it. That's easy to make a mistake. Instead, what we want is a kind of go key, not the space bar, because we use the space bar from go for going between scenes. So to do that, we're going to click over here on the mouse and keyboard section and get something called the keyboard watcher. And I'm going to put it here. It's kind of overlapping, but because I want to move it to the left of that envelope generator. So 
The keyboard watcher looks for you to press keys on the keyboard of your computer. Remember, every actor in Isadora that's a watcher is sort of looking for things to come out come from the outside world. So the keyboard or the mouse or a sensor or a MIDI device, all of these things have watchers that look for things to come in. And the thing that the inputs that are on the left, that determines what that watcher is looking for. And you can see that the range of keys it's looking for, it can actually be a range and not just one, but in this case, it's a single key, the letter A, yeah? So if I take that keyboard watcher and connect it to the envelope generator, if I press letter A, here we go, A, you see that it triggers the envelope generator, we have the fade in, and our movie shows up, yeah? So that's how we can use the keyboard watcher as a way of creating a kind of internal go key for these special cues that we want to create. All right, so that's working pretty well, but what I really like it to do is to fade in briefly and to fade out briefly, yeah? But as you can see, there's only one line here, so how do we do that? Well, that's where you use the segments input. Here I'm going to click where it says 1, I'm going to type 2, and hit return. And now instead of a ramp, we have actually a sort of tent shape, right? And we also got some more inputs here. Yeah, it added more inputs into this, gen uh, this actor. So going through them one at a time, we start at 0, that's value 0. We take one second to go to a value of 100, and then one second to go back down to a value of zero, yeah? So if I hit letter A again, it fades in and it fades out. So now we have this sort of brief appearance of a movie and that works, yeah? So I'd like to add to this by having two movies that I can cue that way. So to save a little time, I'm just gonna select all of those actors like this. I'll go to the edit menu and I'll choose duplicate. So I've got the exact same thing set up. But for the second clip, I want to change the movie here. So I'm going to click over here where it says movie, type 2, and hit return. Now, of course, we don't see anything because they're both dimmed out. But if I hit letter A, oh, actually, that's not what maybe you expected. We saw both movies. But why is that happening? That's because we haven't changed the keyboard watcher to actually look for two different keys. Both keyboard watchers are looking for letter A, even though we changed the movies in the, two, in the movie player. So when I hit letter A, watch those two, watch the envelope generator here and the envelope generator here. See, they both trigger. And that's not what we want. We want to be able to do this independently. So to change the key that it's looking for, we click on that key range input of this keyboard watcher. And then you need to remember this, when you're entering letters, you need to surround them with single quotes, the single quote character that you have on your keyboard. You can see it here, I just typed it. There's a single quote, and then I'm gonna type D, and then another single quote. That's so that it can distinguish you typing a number, which is also possible. That's another way to identify a key. But I type single quote, D, single quote, and now I hit return. At this point when I show this, it often comes up as a question. Why did the key output not change? It still says letter A. But remember what I said about watchers. The things on the left, the inputs on the left, that's what the watcher is looking for. So we changed what it's looking for, but we didn't actually send it the thing it's looking for yet. This output on the right, it sends the key that it sees when you actually press it. So right now it's still letter A because the last key that it saw, if you want to call it seeing, was letter A. But if I press letter D now, and if you watch carefully at that key output, as soon as I do, it says D and it triggers the other clip. So now I can hit letter A and letter D, letter A and letter D, and I can sit here and I can kind of jam showing these clips. I want to just say at this point, this is a technique I've used a lot when I've worked with uh, performance creating performances that sometimes I don't know exactly what content I want to use or the order in which I want to use it. Setting up a little system like this, and you can do plenty more where you have many keys, allows you to kind of watch what's going on and maybe react to it. Oh, maybe I'd like to try this video here or that video there. And you can sort of make almost a video keyboard where you can improvise along with the performers if you're devising a piece, right? So that's a very powerful rehearsal tool and experiment, a way to experiment with creating your show, yeah? All right, we're almost done with this, 
But I think what I'd like to do is I'd like to make it so that they don't always fade out. What I'd like to do is have it fade in and wait. And then when I click a key again, fade out. Well, the envelope generator provides that opportunity with this input here, the trigger mode. Now, right now it says all. When you trigger it, it does all of the segments, our two segments that we have. But if I click on this dot here and I change that to one slash end, now it's going to stop when it gets to the top. And I'm going to do that also on the second envelope generator, one slash end. Okay. So now watch what happens when I hit letter A. It does the first segment, but as soon as it gets to the end, it just holds there and waits. And now it's waiting for a second trigger to do the second segment. Same thing with the actor below, right? So now I've created the ability to fade this in, fade in the other one on top of it. We see both now. I can fade that back out and again. So now instead of just appearing briefly, I can bring things in and take them out. And that's really a nice feature, okay? But there's one gotcha here that you have to pay attention to. So let's do that. Let's fade in our videos. They're both at 100. Okay, and now we're in rehearsal. We're doing something else. We need to go to the next scene, and I'll just simulate that by clicking outside of the scene. Okay, everything went black. That's normal. That's what we expect. But if I click here again, oh, everything's on still. Remember, just like when you disconnect the wire like I showed you before, when you send values into these actors, Isadora always remembers them, even when you leave the scene. It doesn't automatically know that you're you would like it to start at zero. It always remembers the last thing it got. So what do we do about this? Well, there's a special feature that allows you to control this. If you go to any input actually on any actor and click on the word, this special uh, inspector box, we call it, pops up. There are several things in there, and when we start to deal with value scaling, which is something else we will get into, uh, you'll learn more about this. But today, all I want to focus on is this initialize input. If you check that box, whatever value is to the right, when you enter the scene, Isidore sort of automatically types that number in for you or enters that number no matter what it was set to before. So if I do that with the intensity of this projector, I click on the word, I check the box. We can leave it set to zero because we would like it to be faded out. And I do the same with the second projector. Click on the word intensity, check the box that says initialize, and leave it set to zero. Now, remember, look at them. Both videos are faded up to 100%. I leave the scene, and when I come back, they're both faded out. Because Isadora went and it changed the intensity to zero at the moment that you entered that scene. So we start in black, and now I can hit my keys, and I can do my little mix of these clips, right? So there's your tutorial on real-time modulation and internal cueing. The wave generator we looked at, that's useful if you need some kind of cyclical up and down input that never stops. In fact, that actor is very important for doing uh, generative pieces. Yeah, we'll get to that in another tutorial. But the main thing for today was using the keyboard watcher to create a sort of special go key that we could define and then using that to trigger an envelope generator to, in this case, fade in a movie and fade it out. But remember, a number is a number is a number. So those envelope generators could be connected to any numeric input. They could be used to fade in the volume of a movie or to move the movie back and forth or really anything where you see a number, you can use those envelope generators to modulate what that actor does. Yeah. So take some time today. Go a little bit crazy, create a lot of envelope generators with keyboard watchers and connect them to all kinds of different things. You could just work with the projector or if you know a few more things in Isadora, you could experiment with different things. But you could really set up a kind of jam session where you have all these keys on the keyboard that allow you to make the video change and manipulate it in real time as you touch the keyboard. That's a great exercise to really get you up to speed with this. And one last note. Don't forget what I said about clicking on the input or also the output of an actor on the word 
and getting that inspector box. If you need to be sure that when you come back into the scene that the value is set to a specific place, you need to open that inspector box, check the initialize uh, checkbox, and set the value. That's how you can be sure it's always going to be in the right place. All right, fantastic. I look forward to seeing you at our next tutorial.